So thanks for walking us through this entire process. Hopefully our viewers out there will be able to replicate it. Um, but just as a one takeaway, what do you think our viewers should take away from this? Get out of the office. Go for a walk. Let Get me... out right now. Stop watching this yeah, episode. Yeah, stop. Put it out. Shut up. Um, <laughs> what, what do you want your, pl Actually, your plug to do? Actually, can I do that last do? bit again? Oh, okay. You want to be terse? I don't want to be terse. I just want to be a little more succinct. Okay. That, that's what terse means. Terse? Terse means like, like aggressive. Well, if you're being terse for someone, it means you're being a little hostile. Yeah, it's like so. Does sick. it? Oh, it's, okay. It's succinct. It's aggressive. Oh, it's okay. abrasive. Yeah. Got it. Okay. It's curt, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs>
and uh, we had some great conversations and there was so much energy that I knew this is where I needed to be. So I, uh, I went home and I, I sold everything and I moved here. Nice. That's well, fun. welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. I think it's great that you mentioned this need for a full experience. It's not just about the look and the feel, but the copy and the way people interact with the product holistically. I think as innovators, we get really bogged down by the logic uh, and the mechanics behind a product, but those are all things that can be copied, right? You can copy the price, you can copy the features. So that causes products to become commoditized. How do we avoid that? Yeah, you know, I think that, um We've been pushing towards this idea of, of competing based purely on the mechanics of things. You know, uh, my product does the same thing, but it's cheaper, it's lighter, it's faster, or, or whatever. Uh, and, we, and we associate that as being a metric of being better. Um, you know, even when I moved here four years ago, there was a very different culture around heavily engineering focus to what is now much more of a design culture. Uh, and I think somewhere along the lines, people have understood that it's not one or the other. It's not a binary thing, but it's the two working together. The best way I can think about it was, um, I'm actually going to quote some Tony Robbins here, uh, which was sort of the, the science of achievement versus the art of fulfillment. Uh, and I, you know, I decided doing a bit of work into looking to this sort of science versus art type thing. And um, the way I looked at it is, you know, the science, which is the mechanics of things, is is very much needed. You know, you have the logic of, you know, um, you know how something is built and how you can optimize that. And if you look at computers to cars. That optimization and that and that progress has enabled us to have smaller devices that are more cost effective and that does change things dramatically because everyone has access to that. You know, you don't have to pay a billion dollars anymore for one megabyte of RAM and you know air conditioning standard in your car. Um, but on the flip side of that, if you build a product entirely around just competing on that, you know, you don't really differentiate in any particular way. So when you look at when you know uh, for a period there when retailers were going broke and everyone's saying this is the end of retail, why were Apple stores and Nike stores making more money? And, you know, not to sort of uh, reference Apple as a, as a tried old cliche, but, you know, they really understood that, yes, the device was very important, um, it, 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 very important. And, and the supply chain and all the mechanics of delivering that product are extremely important. But what was most important was how people were introduced to that product, how people were supported with that product and the culture around that. And so you have this sort of other side, which is the art. Uh, and the art is sort of, I suppose, the, it's the language, it's the feeling, it's the response. And, People are very emotional creatures. You know, people in the face of supreme logic will still make very irrational emotional decisions. And I think when you compete purely on the mechanics and you don't pay attention to the emotional, the art sort of thing, you just, you, you miss making a meaningful connection. Um, and so I, the way I look at it is the best way I can think about it is a magic trick. You know, a magic trick is this combination of science and art. And when you sort of put the two together, you get this concept of wonder. And so, you know, if I were to make a card disappear right now, you know physically that the card has not disappeared from the face of the earth. You know it's somewhere or somehow it disappeared. So you know that there's a mechanic behind it. But then the art of it is the, is the way I do it, the, the sleight of hand, you know, the, the, the act, so to speak. And together, when you put those two things together, you, you have that wonder of magic. Uh, and I think that's what people ideally pursue in the end. Um, I know that's why you have all these computer companies that were doing the same thing and there really wasn't a differentiator and then suddenly one computer company comes along and has the full package and suddenly everyone wants that. So I think that's, uh, that's great. I think one of the challenges that we often have as, again, innovators, engineers, is that we're told to delight our users. We don't even know what the heck delight means, right? Like, do we need to start doing magic tricks? Do we need to be an illusionist? You know, how can we actually draw our users in and make them feel like they're delighted? So, yeah, I, delight is a buzzword. You know, it's a word that I think was actually even coined by Joni, or Joni Ive. Um, and, you know, it's the way, I, the, the, everybody talks about it as this like magic panacea of like, if you just delight people, then all your problems are solved. Right. But how? The best, right. The best way I can look at if you were to define what is delight, to me, uh, it's about a meeting or exceeding someone's expectation. You know, so if you go to a bank or if you go to a hotel or if you go to a restaurant, you know, yes, there is these standard expectations that you meet that you wish the food to be warm and the price to be reasonable and the, and the restaurant to be clean. But then the delight comes from, you know, they overheard that it's your anniversary and they brought you out, a, a, you know, a complimentary dessert. And so delight is that, that place of really having to understand where someone's at and what's going on in their world and being able to uh, exceed one of their expectations rather than just, just meeting it, you know. And I think... Um, the challenge with that is when you look at most companies, they don't even know who they're trying to help 
to let alone even start beginning to try to exceed any expectations. I mean, half these companies don't even meet expectations, let alone exceed them. And so they think it, it delight comes down to a, an interaction or an interface or a, or a magic button. Uh, and really it's about a relationship. So, you know, whether it's a personal relationship from dating to a friend or whatever, like delight is not um, face, my Facebook algorithm telling me it's your birthday and I've dead on your wall. Delight is me calling you, you know, um, and, and saying happy birthday, Pauline, you know. And I think that is, people are trying to shortcut that uh, but the reality is delight. It's hard work, um, but it's real work. So that seems kind of surprising because a lot of people think that they know who their customers are or they have user experience folks like yourself or they have customer support. So where is the disconnect happening? Why don't they know who their customers are to then exceed expectations? Um, you know, I think people are shitty listeners. You know, What did um, you say? Just kidding. <laughs> they're shitty listeners. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you've only got to have a conversation with most people and, and you can already see that they're not listening. They're already, they've made up their mind about something and they're waiting for you to have a break so that they can interject. And if that were a company, it's like, well, I've just invested all this money building this thing. So I need to find a way to somehow jam it into your life and, and create a perceived, like this is making you better. Right. Um, so, you know, to me about if you really truly want to delight someone, right, it's, it's the person who, who gets you, who knows that you like that thing and oh, you remembered, I only said it once type thing. Uh, and so you have to be you have to be an impeccable listener, and that has to happen before you you start turning to to big data and before you start turning to split testing and optimizing because that is that is that's that's important work but that comes later. Uh, the work that starts out in the beginning is just listening, mm-hmm. going out there and like why is someone why would somebody say that they want this? Why does it matter? Uh, and then when you start trying to connect those dots, um, then you can start to interpret well maybe they would like this thing too or. Um, they mentioned this a few times, even though their actions are like this, maybe this is actually more important. So then you can ask better questions, you know, right. you can start to actually learn. And uh, I think once you sort of have that more comprehensive picture from listening, you know, then you can start to worry about, okay, well, you mentioned that you really love this. So here are a couple of options about that. Like, what do you think about that? Um, but most of the time people start to make fundamental decisions with the big data. Um, and I think the problem with that is you start to have this, you know, correlation implies in causation and you start to create like fictitious scenarios that like, oh, all people must want this. And it's just not true. Yeah. We actually, on the fourth episode, had Indy Young on the show talking about listening sessions and why you want to reserve your judgment. You want to let people speak freely and just have the time to tell you about themselves and their interest rather than jumping to conclusions. Mm -hmm. So who do you think is at fault? Is it management? I mean, we don't want to place blame, but where do you think the disconnect happens and and how can we help people get through that? That's a big question. Yeah. Um, Look, I think it's a cultural thing. You know, I think we live in times that um, it's very go, go, go. You've always got to be right. You know, the cost of being wrong is so high, Mm -hmm. you know, from like where it's social shaming to whatever it might be, you know, or a lawsuit, you you can do no wrong. And I think um, we have this you know, at times an unhealthy culture of always trying to optimize, you know, so that's like you and I being friends, um, but us trying to understand, well, what's the best times that we've had and how do we have more of those and less of the shitty times that we've had and thinking that that's a meaningful relationship, Sure. you know, and the reality of it is, you know, I mean, I've worked in customer service businesses and all kinds of things. And, you know, the greatest time to build an advocate or a champion of your business is, is when you've got to fix something. Mm-hmm. It's not when everything's going really well. Um, but in order to fix something, you need to be a great listener. And I think, Culturally, that, that's something that needs to change is people just need to develop skills um, which extend beyond just having empathy, yeah. um, but actually more along the lines of compassion around like, okay, well, what's this person saying? Why would they be saying this? How do I acknowledge that, I've, that I acknowledge that? You know, I don't have to change my position or how I feel about it in order for their position to exist. Uh, and how do I help them in this, in this regard, you know, and not make it about themselves? Um, and I think that's very difficult for a company when they're so heavily invested in their magic bullet being the one that they want to sell. Um, and what you find a lot is people trying to fit things after the fact. You know, they've already made the solution and now they're trying to find the problem type thing. Right. Uh, where if they invested the same time, energy and resources into better listening at the beginning, they they could have something really compelling for the same money yeah. uh, in the same amount of time and people would want it, you know. Um, but that's that's that, that, that catch-22 that people are... Uh, you know, it's, uh, what is it, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I, I think some people would also argue that your customers or other folks don't really know what they want. So what do we as innovators do, even if we do take the time to listen and they give us either like too many things or it's unclear? Yeah. Um, one of the things I've learned in my time is that people lie. 
Uh, people lie intentionally, people lie unintentionally. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is multifaceted. Um, but if I were to bring it back to one core concept is uh, we operate on these series of rules. My company's rules, my rules, your rules, um, you know, society's rules, our culture's rules. Uh, and these rules are these heavily embedded things from a very young age along the way that we then continue to validate and surround ourselves with people who validate these things. And so if you're trying to, if you're trying to truly understand where someone's coming from, they may, they may just tell you a rule. Uh, they themselves may not even believe in the rule. And if something better came along, they may completely change that rule. That's why you have people who, you know, they're religious one day, then they're not the next or whatever it might be. Um, and I think a, a part of getting into that is, is how do you uh, peel more layers off the onion to get to the root of something? So, for example, if you were running an experiment where you're trying to work out how you're trying to find out how often you work out, you know, most people are programmed to say, well, how often do you work out? It's a very judgmental question. It's very, it's very, to the people, it's, well, it's very direct. Why can't I just get a direct answer? Well, guess what? People aren't like that. Sure. So to get to the bottom of that, I would have to go on this convoluted narrative around like, what does your life look like? And what do you do on Tuesdays? And, and have a dialogue around that. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the line say, so when do you manage to find the time to work out? Mm -hmm. um, but people are not patient for that. And people don't think that way. The, the person who's the person, speaking or yeah. the person that's asking the, the question? The person that's asking the question, right? And so people who are answering the questions, um, they don't even lie on purpose. You know, this is why things like focus groups are really, really kind of distorted um, because people will look to what other people in the room are saying because mm -hmm. they don't want to be the outlier uh, because they have this projected sense of self. Uh, this is why Facebook's so amazing, right? And everybody's life's so much better than yours. Uh, is because they want to project the, their best self. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, if you ask these types of questions or you go out in a very simplistic manner to try and understand people um, because, you know, you don't ask good questions or you're not a good listener or you're not able to read between lines, you will get responses back that may, um, that may pollute your thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it, they may, you know, another thing I see a lot of is people who seek to validate their biases. So they ask very loaded leading questions designed to be like, oh, look, see, people want to do that. But the context and the framing of the question was very, very loaded. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you have to, um, that's, a, that's an art that, you, that people need to learn, that, that practice. And then once you start getting to the root of that, then you can truly start to understand, okay, so this person said this, but they do this. And what could the rule be that this person has around body image or self-belief or confidence or judgment, what, if, what will other people think type thing? And if I really want to impact that behavior, I want them to do that, you know, how do I get to the root of it? So the best way I can think of, you know, is like weight loss. You know, someone's like, oh my God, Pony, I'm really fat. I wish I wasn't so fat as I'm eating another donut. And to most people, it's so logical. Well, stop eating donuts. Calorie in, calories out, you know. But the reality is that's not what, why people are fat. You know, right. That's not why people are overweight. It's not why people smoke. They have gambling addictions, whatever it might be, is there's often a deeper root. Um, an emotional thing, a rule somewhere in their head that they're not good enough or if it, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you don't get to the, and understand that at a very real level, not just a like, okay, cool, well, poor Nima has no self-confidence type thing. If you truly can't relate to that and understand that, you'll never move their needle, ever. Um, and you, you can constantly sell them diet plans, but you that, they won't lose weight. And so at some point, I think, you know, when you want to impact people, you really have to go to that level. You have to dig deeper. So part of the delight then is to understand the, their own motivations or their own rules um, before you can actually design products around that. You know, everyone in life just wants to be understood. Right. Everyone wants to be on the team. Everyone wants to be picked, you know, and I think people will do whatever they sort of feel that they need to do in order to feel that way. And so if you want to delight people, um, for the use of a better word, you know, Yes, you need to understand them. You know, how would I, how would you and I be friends if I didn't make any effort or you didn't make any effort to get to know each other? We wouldn't. We'd just be acquaintances, mm -hmm. right? But we build a friendship because there is a, there is a not only a, a shared interest but uh, like a commitment or a pursuit to want that. You know, and I think that's when you see banks, you know, when they've just, you know, screwed a whole bunch of people over, and the next week on TV they're talking about happy families and how much they love you, and people are like, yeah, right. You know, and it's it's out of integrity. It doesn't line up, and I think that's what happens when you build a product that's all about this, this, and this, but then you deliver in a certain way. And people go, well, we need to delight people. It's like, well, what you're trying to say, is you need to understand their needs and expectations and meet and exceed them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this problem gets worse as we continue to focus on building and optimizing products. It does. Um, you know, the example that I that I just mentioned, you know, about you and me, it's it's very, um, 
it's very personal and we have a lot of time and patience and energy and we can make mistakes and that sort of stuff and you're not always afforded that in the in the in the business world um, you know you, you may have multiple people involved people who are in and out of jobs uh, you have different you know more people to talk with and get feedback from and so there is a need to structure that um, when you when you uh, you know trying to deliver something to delight many many people and not just one you know there's there's a lot more uh, nuance I suppose in, in trying to appeal to people so the best way to do that is most people then turn to go, well, who are our users? And they'll create up some marketing persona and this is a point email, take a photo and then they'll make a whole bunch of stereotypical assumptions about like people and in that demographic and decide that that's who we want to target. And it doesn't mean that to a certain degree there isn't an element of truth to that. Um, but the, if you really want to understand um, who you want to, want to target and how you want to build this pot and how you want to delight people on an ongoing basis, you really need to understand their psychology. So the recommendations that I would normally make to people is start with the psychographics of things, and then worry about the demographics. You know, the demographics is targeting later on to optimize a language or a best way to sell it to someone. Uh, but in the beginning, it's saying, well, we're building this product, we're building this company because we feel a certain way about something uh, and we believe type mm -hmm. thing, right? You've got to have your why statement. Uh, the next comment then is looking at, okay, well, who else believes in that? You know, and why do they believe in that? And, and do they want to be part of that or do they feel strongly enough that they would support us in, in that kind of thing. And so the psychology of looking at people, if, if you want to go say, you know, we want to go save the world doing the following things, is you need to go and understand their worldview. You need to understand their language, understand their fears, all the things that might get in the way of them participating. So again, they might, they might think it's a great idea. And yes, I definitely want this, but then why don't they do it? You know, and you, if you don't understand their, their, their intrinsic and deeper motivations, uh, and their language and the way that they describe it, maybe they're just a pessimistic person or maybe you're targeting a, a demographic that's very suspicious or they grew up in a generation where they don't spend on credit, they only spend on cash. You know, like there may be different attitudes that they have um, that you really need to dig into and understand the root of and decide whether you want to support those or change those. And, you know, one is easier than the other. It's always easier to convince someone to do more of what they already like. Uh, it's a lot harder to convince someone to stop doing something. And so you need to work out which is going to be the best. You know, sometimes if you are if you're doing you know anti drink driving campaign, you're gonna have to tell people some hard stuff that they don't want to hear. Um, but if it's someone who you should go on holiday more, okay. So I think in doing that, if you understand the psychology of why people do what they do, how they feel that what they feel, then you then you start to have, actually have something to say. We are targeting people who th see the world this way, who believe in what we do, and that's why when you look at the tradition, you know, the early Apple campaign around you know the rebels and the misfits. Mm -hmm. They, they were trying to build computers for people who identified with that. Right. Then once you've done that, then you can worry about demographics of saying, okay, well, we want to target people in this particular area. They have more money or they're of this gender or this whatever, so we can tweak the messaging to, 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 mm -hmm. to appeal to that demographic. But you wouldn't want to start there. Yeah. What happens if you start there? Well, you just you just end up developing generic stuff, right? I okay. mean, you end up that developing... That goes back to the... Yeah. I mean, you develop stuff that if, you know, uh, you know... You, you can either alienate a group of people or what you see a lot of is um, the product doesn't fit. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then people summarize that the product uh, was never going to work, uh, that the demographic is stupid or they don't want it, um, or you know there is some sort of optimization issue. It's a price. It's a something issue mm -hmm. when it's just not. You know, they were having the conversation with the wrong people. Sure. You know, and that, that would be like, you know, trying to, trying to convince someone who's not a baseball fan to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a corporate box it. People like baseball. That someone will pay for it. You're just not talking to the right people. But to say well, all males like or all females like baseball is just stupid. So this is all great if you're starting from scratch. But a lot of times there's momentum behind a product, and I'm sure companies come to you and they say, "Oh, you know, we've identified the problem. The problem is user growth, and we just need to fix the signup page. So can you make us a pretty signup page?" Yeah, that's uh, they're always fun projects to have. I've worked with 500, um, like I've worked with like startups uh, and I've worked with Fortune 500 companies as well. And yes, they're very different beasts. Um, but I would say that it still comes back to a common thing, which is how well do you understand the problem you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a difference in resources and legacy systems and you sort of cross those bridges when you get to them. The way I would look at it is when faced with uh, a comment like, you know, we need to fix the sign-up page. I like to dig a little deeper, pull some more layers off the onion and really get to the essence of well, what is it about the sign-up page in, in particular. Um, generally, you can find within a few questions that people really have no idea. Yeah. Uh, and they just sort of think that, well, because we're not getting sign-ups, it must be something related to that. Sure. Um, it's sort of the symptom, not the cause type thing. 
So there's four major sort of steps that I would assess, whether it was a startup, whether it was a 500 company, and I would try to determine whether uh, they actually knew the answers to those. And if they didn't, then that would be a place where I would start. So the four major pillars that I look at is the first of all is how well do they know themselves? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great talk by Simon Sinek who wrote a book about, you know, starting yeah. with why, which looks at well, why does a company do what it does? You know, so what do they believe in and, and why should anyone give a shit? Um, if they don't really know that and to them it's just like, oh, because we sell these things to these people, to me that's not good enough. I really need to get to the essence of, of why something matters. The second thing is then know, how well do they know the ecosystem in which they're operating? So who are the people involved? Mm -hmm. And how do they, with their idea or their product, do they see themselves impacting that ecosystem in, in, a, in a meaningful or, or a positive way? If they haven't really thought about that, then that's irresponsible. Uh, if they have thought about it, then, you know, what's the answer to that? You know, are they, are they trying to, rather than just make people's lives better, but how well do they actually understand that, okay, if I dig a hole over here, then some that has consequences, but the consequences outweigh, or the, the benefits outweigh the consequences type mm -hmm. thing. The third thing is who are the people in that ecosystem specifically? Um, and so how well do they know those people, their psychology? Why would somebody want this? You know, the way I always sort of try to do like a bit of a sanity check on these kinds of things is if somebody could get the same emotional feeling or the outcome from something else but compared to what you're doing, they, they could possibly well and truly do that. Mm -hmm. So you're building some app right now. Let's just say, uh, you know, to get around town, the best way to do it is Uber. But next week, suddenly, they've discovered some new technology that if you dig a hole in your backyard and you stick your head in it, um, then you'll be transported to wherever you need to get to. People probably do that. That's probably the hyperloop. Right, it'd be the hyperloop, right. Um, so as a result, you people are more committed, I suppose, to achieving that feeling or that outcome, more so maybe than they are using your product. So if you don't really deeply understand that psychology of those people, then then you wonder why, well, what's this new hole in the ground thing? And you become you know, one of the incumbents that are now complaining about Uber. The last thing is knowing the context. And the, this is this is a big thing, you know, and this is, and to me, context is focus. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there and say, well, we understand why we do what we do and it's all very, you know, important work and we understand the ecosystem in which we operate and we even have a deep understanding of the people we're, we're doing, uh, we're trying to help. But if you don't understand the context in which you're trying to help, um, you know, you still stand to lose there as well. And the, and the context is, uh, in what circumstance particularly will someone need this? And why would they choose this over anything else? You know, and maybe it's a time thing or maybe it's a, a, a coolness thing or, you know what I mean? Preference. A yeah. preference. So if you don't understand those kinds of things very, very clearly and you can't define that, uh, you end up creating, um, you know, problem statements such as, well, we need more signups. So we worked with a startup and I've, I've done the signup problem for quite a few companies. Um, but uh, everything from, you know, big direct TV type brands to, to merging startups. And the common thing is, is that lack of understanding of who you're trying to target and the context in which they're trying to operate um, is very, very important to creating a meaningful user experience. So what I mean by that is there is this um, belief that less is more, less steps makes things better. Mm -hmm. You know, if you went to Ikea and you bought a cabinet, and there's it's like definitely not the case. Yeah. yeah, there's like 50 billion steps and how to like assemble a drawer. But they decide, you know what? Less is more. We're just going to show you the finished drawer. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? It wouldn't be helpful. It wouldn't be useful to you um, because you actually need all the steps. And so part of, you know, one of the startups we worked at is they were trying to push towards this direction of less steps and, and going with mobile best practices. You know, they looked up design blogs and all kinds of stuff. But the reality is they were just designing to copy what everyone else is doing mm -hmm. because that's what everyone else is doing. You know, it's a real herd mentality. When we actually took the time to understand, okay, they're trying to target parents who are trying to help their children in a certain situation. These parents are going to be very invested. These are the same kind of parents who, you know, spend their whole lifetime raising their child and, and being patient with them. You know, they fill in like lengthy college applications and that kind of stuff. It stands to reason that, you know, they may be okay with an extra form filled on the sign up form mm -hmm. if it really means and they believe that this will make a difference to their child's life. So without understanding that very important detail, it's very easy to say, oh, we don't need that, we don't need that, we don't need that. Um, so when you start to, start to understand that context then you can start to create a very tailored experience that you, you, you may find is unique and you may design a new experience that no one's ever designed before and you become mm -hmm. the new gold standard. But you'll never get there unless you, you sort of really sort of go through those four steps. And so when I work with these brands, more often than not, you know, they will have some of those mm -hmm. uh, or maybe to not enough, not enough depth. 
Um, so I sort of implore them to go deeper. Um, but most of the time, they, they don't really have the context down pat. And that, that's, that's the crux. Because if I was a coffee shop and I'm trying to sell you coffee at midnight, you know, you'd be like, well, call me at seven in the morning, but I don't drink coffee at midnight. And that context really matters. Got it. So I'm a firm believer in teaching by example, and I think the example you gave of the startup that you worked with where they were focused on parents and children is great. Why don't we dig in a little bit deeper to understand what the problem statement was, and hopefully our viewers out there can learn a little bit from that. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, the, the original brief was, you know, we need to uh, make our sign-up form better um, type thing. And when we started looking at the user research for us, it, uh, so the context was this is a company that was developing social media monitoring software mm -hmm. um, so that parents could link their children's social media accounts and monitor, not spy, uh, on their children's uh, activity in case anything. So if anything came up that was particularly wiring, the parent would be notified. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it didn't really, they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't reading all the messages type thing. So when we started to dig into this, we sort of, you know, asked us typical questions. Okay, well, why are you doing this? And, you know, the, the, the first response was because we want to help parents, you know, um, you know, feel peace of mind with their children or along the lines of that, which to me was a very mechanical response, right? Mm -hmm. It's like saying, you know, I, I sell coffee cups because, you know, people drink coffee. Um, so we sort of dug a little bit deeper there and we tried to look at, okay, well, why does that even matter? And mm -hmm. so the thing that was interesting about the startup is all the founders were parents. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got into some interesting debates and it got into some heady conversations where it was like, don't tell me how to parent my children type thing. It was great. It was a great energy because what it came back down to was, well, why do you even care about this? And they're like, because I want to make sure that my child, you know, um, develops the, the, the skills to, to navigate life as a great adult. And so I felt that was very important because even by focusing on on that very particular point, they weren't trying to focus on parents or who were trying to manage their children or, you know, to like save their children. They were trying to focus on parents who were trying to raise young adults, mm -hmm. which was very important as, as, very, as a very important differentiator. When we then looked at the ecosystem of who was involved, we understood that there were the parents and then there were the kids and then there were potentially teachers and other kids and that sort of stuff. And so we started looking at saying, well, okay, well, what does a conversation look like? Because right now the way that the sign-up form is designed is the parent signs up and does all this stuff and then they need to go get the kids' credentials. Mm -hmm. How do we include the children in that conversation? Because for this ecosystem to work, for the child to want to do it, they need to have buy-in. And so in order to do that, we decided, well, how do we design a sign-up flow that incorporates the children as part of that, as part of the conversation, and it's organic, as opposed to this, you hit a roadblock now, and I don't know, however you go get the child's details, is up to you. But when you do, come back to us, and then you'll be able to enjoy this. The third thing was understanding the, the, the psychology of these, of these people. And so that's where we extended, okay, well, why would a child not want to do this? Why would a parent be afraid of doing this? And then when we understood that the parent may feel... Uh, you know, they don't know how to have a conversation with a child about this, maybe because the parent's not tech savvy, uh, maybe because they don't have a, they have a challenging relationship with their child, something like that. We thought, well, is there an opportunity that we can maybe be a little proactive? Mm -hmm. um, so rather than to sit back and go, well, we're waiting for your, for your child's login details. Hey, we noticed that, you know, it's been a couple of days since you signed up. Um, you know, how are things going? You know, here's some great tips that other parents have used to have this kind of conversation. It's very difficult conversation with their children. Uh, and then last of all was this sort of context. And the context then really focused the lens around, well, which, uh, what are the best relationships, what is the best scenario for this to happen, right? So why would somebody choose to do this? And we broke up into this idea of, okay, well, maybe there's, you know, three different types of parents. There's parents that have great relationships with their children, parents who have challenging relationships with their children, um, but normal, healthy, uh, and then parents who have very poor relationships with their children. Maybe they never live together. And so... It's very easy to say, well, we want to target parents who have great relationships. But, you know, realistically, parents who have great relationships may not need this software because what makes a great relationship? Well, you know, that means that they, they're knowledgeable and they have a, a, an open communication style and, you know, they have that sort of trust and whatever. So we really want to focus on the challenging relationship side of things. So when we looked at the challenging side of things, then we had to understand, well, okay, what makes a challenging relationship and how would one navigate that knowing that context of you want to have this conversation there may be some tension. Mm -hmm. And so when we understood all of that side of things, we actually created a sign-up flow um, that it wasn't shorter. It was actually, I think, one screen longer. Mm -hmm. um, it was completely remodeled around like the order of events. 
um, but we included support information for parents after a certain period of time uh, when our children were actually able to sign themselves into it, but they had their own landing page that was in their language and, and sort of sold a product from a child's perspective. Um, and so we, we sort of really just tried to not focus on less is more or even, I mean, obviously we, we did argue about the UI at some point, but the idea was how do you build an experience that, that supports, you know, what the founders were trying to create and why, which was, um, you know, we want to, we want to help parents raise responsible young adults mm -hmm. uh, in, the con in the ecosystem of where we understand that there are parents who have challenging relationships with their children uh, in the context of, you know, um, so that, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was along the lines it, that when they are faced with some difficult decision, you know, for, faced with some difficult scenarios in their life, they have a platform or, or a dialogue uh, to, to have a conversation with their parents. So the problem statement went from in this very simple fix a sign up form into like a, a paragraph. Yeah. But the reason why that's so important is, you know, I, I'm a, I like my metaphors. It's like if I said to you, Ponima, uh, we need to paint this room, right? What happens is if you're an engineer and I'm a designer and someone else is a business person and a marketer and, and whatever, people default to what they know best. Sure. Right? You only got to ask someone what you should do about your relationship or your life or whatever. And whatever that person's done in their life, like that's the, that's the advice you're getting, right? And so that creates a very, I suppose, a, a broken and, and... It's biased. It's a very, it's a very a difficult environment, you know, because everybody wants to solve the problem how they think the problem yeah. should be solved. If you are able to say, okay, look, we're all in this together. We need to design this room and you, and you a lot more focused in Ponina. So this room is going to be used for the situation mm -hmm. for these kinds of people on this kind of day in this kind of context. So we're going to have, we're going to be doing some filming in here, you know, on, on a Tuesday morning, blah, blah, blah. Suddenly now when you're able to focus people's perspective, you're able now to say, so how would we do that technically? How would we design that? How mm -hmm. would that workflow look like? How would we, you know, communicate that with words? And suddenly everybody's sort of sharing a common goal. And so it's so important to have that detailed problem statement and allow people to solve the problems. That's why you employ them, to mm -hmm. solve the problems, right. not to just like go to Dribble and look up sign-up forms and best practices and copy-paste. So, yeah. So, the, yeah, the context overall and having people understand that context will do away with those biases and their way of solving the problem. Um, absolutely. I, I think that... You know, if I look at design versus art as a concept, you know, art is very, you know, that's my opinion, that's my song, that's my piece of work. If you don't like it, not my problem. Design is, is much more of service to others. And to There's me, a context, yeah. Yeah, to me, design is the art of translation mm -hmm. and then nothing more. You know, it is simply, I have something in which you're trying to understand whether it's instructions for your IKEA cabinet to signing up for this app. Um, and however, I need to meet your needs so you can feel confident doing that. And I think when people um, take the focus off themselves, as in what I think as a designer, what you think as an engineer, and it's more about like, how do we help that person mm -hmm. who's in that situation? Um, suddenly now, you know, we're able to contribute in a more meaningful way, in a more collaborative way, mm -hmm. rather than just fighting for territory. So now that you've nailed the problem statement, what comes next? So what you do is you would, you know, start the design process of, you know, maybe expanding some thoughts around, you know, a user journey or a workflow of how things are done. Uh, and then you start to, you know, wireframe prototype, that kind of thing. So what we did for this particular company was once we understood the, I suppose that, 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 I mean, we looked at everything, behavioral psychology of children and parents and, you know, read all kinds of weird, weird and interesting articles about it. And basically what we're trying to get down to is, okay, here is the current workflow in the way that somebody sort of, uh, or, or a parent or a child gets through this experience. And this is the workflow that we think, uh, would be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so along the way in there, we looked at, okay, well, what would be the metric points? So some of the things we broke them down as well. So rather than disable a sign up as somebody who gets through the whole process, a sign up may be someone who actually clicks, you know, they enter their name and then they get to screen two and the screen two when they're asking for their child's credentials, like we still consider that a successful sign up because that next metric now is like, you know, connecting an account. So, you know, you're having a much more granular funnel. Mm -hmm. So when we understood, you know, these were the metric points, uh, we then basically designed out that workflow. And then in that workflow, you design out, okay, well, what would all the potential screens be for that particular scenario? So we knew that, the, you know, everything from error handles to what happens here, what happens there. And it's the, that typical sort of wireframing, whiteboard wireframing design process, uh, at which point then you would, you know, prototype that up and then you would um, start to socialize that and see how people feel. The way we did it is, you know, typically, you know, um, we had an engineer designer uh, and 
uh, like a UI designer and me doing UX, uh, worked together. And so there wasn't this sort of like the waterfall style. Right. We were all immersed in the problem. We created the problem statement together. We wireframe together. We did the UI together. Uh, you know, and people, there was always someone in the room who was more, that was their strong suit. Mm-hmm. So they would maybe lead the charge on that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the others, you know, didn't sort of go off and do other things. They would, they would, um, you know, basically, you know, give feedback and, and, and test things and, and help optimize and that kind of stuff. Um, so generally in that example, like the reason I like that particular story is we had five days mm-hmm. and we had five days to completely redesign the, uh, the onboarding sign up flow. Wow. That's a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, most of the time, you know, people like, you know, it's like a hackathon, like go, 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 just do anything, right? Anything that sticks. By day three, we were still talking about users and psychology and whatever. And, and, and the startup was getting a little antsy. You know, they want to see some screens. They needed to see something. And we, we you know, implored them to be patient. And we're glad that they, they, they took our advice. Um, by the time we got to sort of Wednesday afternoon, we'd sort of worked out that workflow with the metrics. And everyone was like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Uh, we actually punched out the wireframes. Uh, UIs for iPad and iPhone uh, with a de- de- developer guide and a style guide and all sort of stuff like that in two days. Wow. And the best way I can look at that is when you sort of followed that process, it's like you're making dinner and you know what you're cooking and you've been measuring out all the quantities and you've got it all ready to go and now you just got to cook it, right? And it's and you're likely to, and then, you know, the order of events and suddenly dinner's done in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but typically the other way, sometimes when people get a little hasty, that is like, Quick point, even we've got to cook dinner. There's no time to waste. Just throw things in the saucepan. Just make it happen, you know, and then keep adding salt. And how does that taste? And the problem with that is, you know, you end up just, you know, making a poop sandwich. So, um, so for us, you know, at the end of that, uh, we had uh, full prototype uh, and all the, and the screens and yeah, and they implemented it and it's working well. So you front loaded a lot of the work by having the conversations, establishing the context, and really digging into like who the user was, and then that made the design process the mechanics of actually doing the wireframes, the error handling, the actual copyright. workflows. And the copyright. I mean, yeah. we did everything. We did even even the copywriting uh-huh. you know, on every particular screen, like yeah. what the screen was going to say. But what's important, what, what we needed to deliver wasn't just um, a design project, mm-hmm. you know, a solution of like, here, that's that's the thing. We needed to to provide that but we also wanted to provide them some thinking yes so that when they wanted to solve future problems for themselves right. and then they wanted to change the profile page and the news feed and the whatever they didn't have to like keep going now what do we do now what do we do because they they had that thinking mm-hmm. they knew why they were doing it and what context and for whom and what the ecosystem looked like and they and they knew their story and then so every problem that they were going then to solve um they they would follow our process sure and then they would, they could solve their own problems they wouldn't always need to remake um probably you know is is something that um is it takes a little time to practice but generally um you know i I want to empower people to to think for themselves and and to be powerful about doing that and and, you know build their own great products yeah that's great as opposed to just designing their sign up flow and they come back to you and say oh now we have retention problem right i mean i definitely think i mean it's probably good in the short term for me um but Long term, I'm more committed to helping people create great things. Yeah. And I think that if you, you know, they'll teach a man to fish type thing. Right. I think it's just, it's, it's a better outcome for everyone. Thanks for walking us through this entire process. I know our viewers out there are going to find this really valuable and can hopefully replicate it. But let's boil this down to one takeaway for our viewers that they can use tomorrow and beyond. Absolutely. Um, I would say study people. Uh, whether that's behavioral psychology, learning to listen, uh, getting out of the office, go and immerse yourself in your user's world. Maybe that's a skate park, maybe that's a hospital ward, whatever it might be. Really go and understand their world rather than sort of try to observe from the sideline. Um, what I've found so many times, even, you know, even everything that I've read and I've, I've studied online, you know, you, you just spend five minutes in a hospital ward and suddenly there are things that you're like, I didn't even think of that. And so what I, I suppose I would, I would distill it down to is, you know, sometimes the work that needs doing isn't the work that you think. So if our viewers out there want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Uh, best way would be my website, paulieting.com. Great. Uh, or my portfolio, who is paulieting.com. Thank you. Just to quickly recap this episode, we covered two major points to help you build products that will delight your users. The first thing we talked about is to go beyond the mechanics of a product. You know, how is it built? What are the online profiles and their interactions? And to really dig in and understand your user's world. And to do that, you've got to step into it. You need to have conversations with them. You need to have listening sessions. 
The second is once you've established that context, then creating a problem statement, collaborating with your team. And while that might take some days, it's important work to do. Once you do that work, then you can go through the design process of creating workflows and prototypes and iterating. So thanks again to our special guest, Polly Ting, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And of course, to all of you out there, our viewers, for tuning in today, and our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for helping in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode of Femgineer TV, then please share it with your friends, your coworkers, and your boss. And let us know in the blog comments below what your favorite part of this episode was. Subscribe to FemGineer's YouTube channel to receive the next episode of FemGineer TV, where I'll be hosting founder and CEO of Style Seat, Melody McCloskey. Thanks for tuning in today, and I'm looking forward to reading your blog comments. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster. Listen on to get. <laughs> I was going to get this. This is the last one. Yeah. Woo -woo -woo. It's waiting for him to be done. So, if people want to follow up or get in touch with you, how can they do that? Yeah, so I have my, my blog, Pauly Ting, P-A-U-L-Y-T-I-N-G. You don't need to spell it. I'm going to okay, put it in the... It. <laughs> cool. Let's do it again. All right, let's do it again. Okay. If you've enjoyed this episode of Femgineer TV, then please share it with your friends, your team... What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> If you've enjoyed, stop getting into my world! You're in my world, okay. <laughs> Yes, get out. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode, oh, that was the. <laughs> All right, let's get to this.